Oh, sorry. <laughs> hey, everyone. It's a dose of Dr. <clears throat> Drew. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the stream. We'll give you a chance to pile in. I love how you, your intro is a cough. Well, uh, I, have a mor- I have a morning cough, and it has nothing to do with the COVID-19, so I apologize for that. Um, it's interesting already on the restream, you guys are asking questions about novel therapeutics, and it just occurs to me that, that Susan is somebody we had to get in here, somebody talking about all the, you know, at least 100 different studies on out there that are s- spiraling around as potential therapeutic uh targets for the COVID-19, and uh, the academics are trying to whittle it down to about eight uh, so they can really zero in their study. Of course, uh, hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir are likely to be um, at, the, at the bullseye of all that, um, both of which have promising stuff anecdotally coming out, but no good studies yet, which I'm sort of disappointed by. I thought we'd get some good studies by the end of last week, this week, uh, maybe next week. But uh, I see you all on the restream. Uh, we're not going to talk from the stream today because I have a very special guest. Uh, we have Dr. Seema Yasmin. She is disease detective, public health physician, former epidemic intelligence service officer. Anecdotally, Whoops, sorry. Sorry. what is that now? That's my phone. <laughs> uh, she uh, is uh, has expertise in the spread of health misinformation and disinformation during epidemics. Could there be a more prone, appropriate time for her expertise to come to bear? She has a book, well, several books, but the second book is Debunked, Pseudoscience, Medical Myths, and Why They Persist. Dr. Yasmin, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So uh, I imagine, could there be a more fertile landscape for your expertise than the present moment? What, what are you seeing? Right, so this is exactly the thing that I studied, Dr. Drew. I started off as a disease detective in the Epidemic Intelligence Service, kind of flying into the hot zone to track contagion, see who was getting sick, and figure out a way to stop disease from spreading. What I saw during nearly every epidemic investigation, though, was that even though I was focused on the disease about the virus or bacteria, it, disease was not the only thing that was spreading, and disease was not spreading alone. It was spreading hand-in-hand with rumors, health hoaxes, misinformation and disinformation about diseases. That's what led me to journalism school to become a journalist and study communication. One of the things that blew my mind was, you know, we're seeing all these mathematical models right now where you plug in different assumptions, different factors, and you get some idea of how big could this outbreak get? How many people could die? How many could get infected? Well, I used to use those models for HIV, for example. And then when I trained in communication, I learned that you can use the exact same model to track not the spread of disease from person to person, but the spreading of information. Well, let, let me, I'm going to stop you. Can we hold on a second? Yeah, I'm going to stop Your, you. Your audio I, I, changed. Yeah, I can hear every word she's saying, but I'm, I'm not sure it's getting all the way out because everything she's saying is, did you, we need did to hang, you, you need to, those of you that are listening need to hang on every well, word. We're going to, yeah, we're, we're going to do this again. Can, did, did you put your phone on speaker or are you, is it, because when you, you call No, I didn't change anything. Okay. Um, do you have, I'm, I'm, I hear every word she's Are you on a computer saying. or a telephone? A telephone using a microphone and a headset. Can you just can you just put just hold the phone to your face and and because it's yeah, not working. It's, it's not working correctly. I, I, and we can try Zoom. And too, people are are. People are, are. Is this any better? Oh, oh way better. Okay. Way better. Okay. Way better. Okay. Oh, amazing. Uh, okay. Although Beautiful. there's some feedback, are you getting that feedback? Yeah. Too? Okay, so this is way better. I, I, I don't want you to repeat anything you said because I, I think... No, no, no. Uh-oh, now we're getting <laughs> feedback. Oh, boy. Okay. Do you want to try Zoom, Susan? Uh, it's weird. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, you guys are, are listening. This, this You see that Dr. Yasmin is going to be a very important guest here. She's got information you need to hear. I apologize. Okay, I have, a, I have a... Okay, I have a... Can I use your phone, Drew? Mm-hmm. While, while we're setting this up, I will deal with you all on the restream a little bit. Uh, good morning to you all. I see your greetings there. Uh, thank you for the words of support. I, I understand we're having an audio issue, so hold on a little bit. Uh, uh, I don't know why it's doing that. It's so weird. Yeah. Um, it was working fine a minute ago. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. I'm just following up. Uh, okay. Uh, Don Adams says, does the Santa Clara study prove I've been right? Well... No, nobody's going to be perfectly right on anything. This is all a moving target, right? 
Uh, what he's referring to is a study out of Stanford that looked at uh, a 3,300, I think, um, representative sample in a county of 2 million called Santa Clara. And they expected about equivalent of 1,000 antibody positive cases in a setting of 2 million individuals in the, in the, in the population. And what they found was eight, 50 to 80 times that. So it's possible that at least in California, if that county proves to be representative, that we will have 50 to 80 times the number of exposed individuals in this state as compared to what we thought was going to be the case, which is a rather extraordinary difference. And it should, uh, A, decrease the fatality rate of this thing in California and increase our moving towards herd immunity and may help us open up the economy a little bit. So that study was a very big deal. If it gets reproduced in other counties, we will see. So again, uh, our estimates are off by a factor of 50 to 80 times. It's a really interesting observation. <clears throat> uh, some of our uh, restreamers are saying for Dr. Yasmin to turn off her periscope while, while she's talking to us. <clears throat> what are the numbers logged in the Murray model for the higher than the numbers out of New York? Why are the numbers logged in the Murray model far higher than the numbers out of New York governor's office? That's very interesting. Let me look at that. And I don't know which numbers you're talking about specifically. Are you talking about fatality rates? You're talking about hospitalization rates? Depends what you're saying. So right now, as of today, the projections out of the Murray model, so-called in University of Washington, is beds needed around 13, 16,000, ICU beds around 5,000, and the fatality rate uh, deaths in this state of New York around 14,000. It's a lot of people. It's a big outbreak. Uh, New York is not like the rest of the country, though it could be, and that's the question. Is California truly, is there something truly different going on in California than New York? Uh, or are we all in for the same thing if we're not extra careful in how we uh, activate our containment strategy? Now, I'm hoping Dr. Yasmin will help us, um, <clears throat> you know, help us uh, elucidate some of this stuff. Uh, but you see, I'm, I'm very interested in talking to her. What she was telling us was <laughs> that she could track misinformation spreading virally in the same manner as the actual infectious diseases, almost like mirroring the infectious disease outbreak, which is a fascinating idea. How many people have died this day as opposed to last year? I think, Frank, we are actually at about par uh, because we're not driving the roads, we're not uh, engaged in crime, we're not doing things that are otherwise uh, taking people's lives. So the question is, I, I don't think that's a fair comparison. I mean, to be, you know what I mean? Of course, there are going to be consequences of the lockdown that are separate from the goal of reducing transmission. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Sherry. <coughs> I'll just clear my throat. Dr. Yasmin? If it's working. Hi. Oh, that's clear as can be. Very oh, nice. Yeah. Very okay. nice. Okay. Thank you. FaceTime. Okay. okay. So if the phone, hopefully the phone will stay on. And so uh, Dr. Yasmin, I, I was just recapping for the viewers what you, what you were saying, and I think they got it, that you were seeing a mirror, well, a, a, a I don't know what the word to use. I don't know what to say. Uh, a similar distribution of misinformation to the actual uh, uh epidemiology of the outbreak of the infectious disease. Is that about summarize what you were saying? Yeah, so basically we go into epidemics and we focus so much on the virus that's spreading and not so much on the information about the virus that goes, well, viral. And sometimes it's really good information. It keeps people informed, tells them what's happening and how to stay safe and things like that. Other times, it's really bad information that endangers people's lives because it's not accurate, because it's saying things like, in this instance, oh, if you can just hold your breath for 10 seconds, that proves that you don't have COVID-19. Or even worse, you know, early on in this pandemic, there were all these internet rumors about drinking bleach, of all things, and that being a way to protect yourself. So as I track the spread of disease and the spread of misinformation, I think it's really important to also focus on the health hoaxes and the myths because those can really be dangerous to people's lives. Who, who is responsible for the, the distribution of that? I mean, it's such a new world with social media. I'm, I'm imagining most of it is through social media and word of mouth, whatnot. But it seems like the, it, the, the so-called traditional press grabs onto it and uh, piles on sometimes. It can happen that way, and we're seeing it at all levels. So it can be tweets that go viral and just 
happened to capture people's imagination and they take off and they started from somebody who had no background in science, for example. The press has a really interesting role, Dr. Drew, in that the press can jump on myths and help the public understand what's wrong about it. So I think we have to really try and leverage that power of, hey, folks, you may have heard this thing and this thing over here. Need you to know those aren't true. And actually what you need to do is these things to stay safe. But we also have these White House press conferences where the president and other politicians say one thing at the podium. And then literally a few minutes later, you know, Dr. Fauci or other experts come and kind of have to backtrack for them. And that can be very confusing for people because they hear one politician say one thing and then another expert say a different thing. So when you have a crisis situation like this, you need accurate information. You need people reading from the same playbook. And there's already so much anxiety and concern that you don't want to overwhelm people with mixed messages. Right. And and I, I've been saying from the beginning, listen, I, you know, I was alongside Dr. Fauci during the HIV epidemic. He's the reason I got involved in media. At that time, he was chanting that, you know, I... I don't remember his number was three million or ten million. He was, you know, there's gonna be. I, my recollection is ten million dead, ten million dead, and we got to get the word out. And so it literally motivated me to go on the radio and educate young people about HIV. We were calling it just stop calling it grids, and we're calling it AIDS at that moment. And uh, and we ended up with 175,000 dead and not 10 million. Uh, and then we patted ourselves on the back for for um, for the you know essentially making a whole generation quite anxious. But we felt that it was appropriate. Um, but so, so it seems to me that, you know, the press should be saying, listen to Fauci, listen to the CDC, don't politicize this. Let's just stay with the scientists, stay with the experts. This is these, it's Dr. Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci's job to get us through this safely. Listen to them. Instead, what the press That's seems right. to, instead what the press seems mm-hmm. to do is politicize everything and make it even more confusing, which is, it's really the source of, it's almost, it reminds me of the French revolution where people are just put up on the guillotine for essentially political expediency, and then we lose track of what we should be listening to, which is Dr. Fauci. So, you know, I will say there, Dr. Duda, you know, we talk about the press as this monolith, and of course, within that, you've got so many different journalists and so yeah. many different news organizations, and it's wonderful to see some that are really doing that public service, right, of asking the difficult questions, of holding our politicians accountable, of saying, hey, where are the tests? It's March now, it's April now, where are the tests? So I just want to be careful that we're saying, yeah, there are definitely some news outlets that don't serve the public during a time like this. They just foster more anxiety and they're not asking the difficult questions. But thankfully, there are some outlets that do that really important public service of keeping us informed and, and holding our leaders accountable for our safety. So do you do you have a recommendation for whom we should listen to? It feels like that it's become such a commercial enterprise in this country that it's whoever can create the most clickbait, which is not the greatest source of information. Is there somebody that you looked at? I mean, I read the New York Times every morning, and I'm, I'm a discerning scientist, so I can sort of sort through the nonsense. But for the average person... It's not going to be a good source of information, even the New York Times. Uh, it's there, but it's not well, exclusively there. Yeah. Well, right. And that's the thing. I think you do need to grab different bits of information from different people. One of my favorite science journalists is Amy Maxman. And you can follow her on Twitter. But she really gets into the weeds with the science and does a great job of explaining what's going on. She was bit ahead of the New York Times, actually, in shining a light on the issues with testing and some of the problems happening in Washington what, State. What's her name again? I'm, I'm going I'm to follow her. Tell me again her name is Amy. Her name Amy Maxman. M-A-X-M-E-N. Amy Maxman. She's M-A-X-M-E-N, I think. E-N. okay. Um, we'll follow and her. She's wonderful, so I would follow her. I am trying to stay on top of the misinformation because I know there's so much out there. So I'm doing videos that go on YouTube for Wired basically responding to the questions that I get inundated with. Some weeks that's about antibody testing, some weeks it's about vaccines, some it's about masks. So just trying to stay on top of that. Um, but definitely be aware and be wary of those headlines that try and wrap things up with a nice bow and make things sound really conclusive. Because unfortunately, we're not there yet. And you know, you were just talking a few minutes ago about that new antibody study that's already led to these headlines that are like, whoa, maybe 85 times more infections than we've even detected. But when you look at the science, that hasn't even been peer-reviewed yet. And I find there are some flaws with it. It doesn't mean it's not a good study. It just means we need to be really careful in how we explain 
the findings, I think, to a broad well, let's, audience. Let's go ahead. and uh, my, my way of explaining it is, oh, what an interesting observation. Let's see if other mm -hmm. counties have similar levels of immunity. Isn't that about the Absolutely. easiest way to understand it? So it, it's, a, it's an interesting sure. ice pick. It's a moment of time that may lead us in a certain direction. It needs to be further, further elucidated. Yeah, and I think, you know, you look at the study results for any study, it's great to look at what were the strengths of it, but then also to keep in mind what were some of the limitations. Yeah. And I think with this study in Santa Clara, where I live, if you look right. at the map of where folks came from mm -hmm. who were in this study, it's not evenly distributed across the county. And then the way that they weighted some of that information gives more weight to some people than to others. Then you have this issue that folks who decided to be in the study were able to take along a child with them. So that starts to skew results because you think about a kid that you live with in the same house as you, you're likely to have been exposed and perhaps if one person's infected, right. then another person would have been too. Yes. But I think, you know, just a final point about that study, it, it's telling us that their antibody test is very specific, very high level, around 95%, meaning that everyone who's truly negative tests negative. But we know that tests aren't always that perfect. Right. So if that assumption ends up being even a little bit wrong, it drops these numbers a lot. And so we may be looking at maybe tenfold or twentyfold more infections than we currently know, but maybe not fifty to eighty-five fold more. I, I had two questions about it. Maybe you can answer for me. Did, were they doing blood draw serum tests or the rapid antigen test, ra rapid antibody tests? I would have to check that part of it again. Um, I read that, right? that part of it a while ago. There's a lot of confusion flying around about these rapid tests and their high false negative rates and all kinds of things. So That's the that, issue. That worried me. Right. One. And then number two, I thought, how far is Santa Clara and the, and the, and the, the regions that they were testing from, how's that, how far is that from the San Francisco airport? Because that might be an unusual mm -hmm. sort of contact. You know what I mean? People might so be... These that, that's exactly it. These are really good questions. You think about flights that go directly from SFO to Asia, right? And Lots, so perhaps that starts to skew the right? data as well. Yeah, right, all yeah. The time. So, so uh, I thought maybe that's going to skew it a bit. It has to, it has to. But to be fair, I mean, we have regions like that in Southern California too that are not just connected to the airport, but are specifically part of the back and forth and be really interesting to see what's going on in those communities. Um, and sure, so even as I poke holes at this study, which I do with every single study I read, because there's always limitations, I'm still really glad that it happened, and I want to see more like that. Yeah. What, what, what's your, uh, this, I have so many questions, this, I'm almost like in a Rorschach. It, it, what is your general, um, do, you, do you try to come up with assessment of, because really the big challenge right now is how do, we op how do we start to move back out with a containment strategy? Do you have any opinion about how we do that? Yeah, so as an epidemiologist, we look at four key factors when we're even starting to think about peeling containment measures back. Firstly, you want to see a dramatic decline in the number of deaths and the number of cases. Second, you want to make sure that you've got really widespread testing capacity. Third, you want to make sure your healthcare systems are ready in case you see more outbreaks. And lastly, you want to make sure that you have resources locally to do contact tracing. Because in a nutshell, you want to trace, test, and isolate. And until you can confidently kind of check the boxes on those four things, you can undo all of the gains you've made from the containment measures by lifting them too quickly. And that's what I worry about, that we're in this first wave, but we have to think about a second wave too. And it would be a nightmare situation to lift these containment measures just to see the virus get the upper hand again and resurge. And that sometimes second waves are worse than the first wave. Right, so like we really have to be Spanish, mindful about that. Spanish flu was an example of that. But but I, here's my my. You, you said exactly you know of course what I've heard before. But I keep asking, yeah yeah yeah. I, I get it. But what? How and when? How exactly? Do we have any novel strategies? Do we have any technologies we can deploy? Are we? What about the antibody testing? Which one can we rely on? How much viral testing are we going to do and how are we going to lay that out? Thankfully, L.A. County, I don't know if you're aware, has really uh, stepped up its game on the viral testing. They are doing yeah. it like this week yeah. as of Wednesday, man. It was on. And so that proves it can be done. Uh, but no it antibody. Can, and that's and, really good. Yeah, no antibody testing. So, A, you know, how do we, you know, what are we doing? And whatever happened to that Google Apple plan to have alerts on our phone of isolating or whatever it was going to be, they, I just hear it just crickets. When I look mm -hmm. look to the mm -hmm. and, and I think it's going to have to be the state governments and not the federal government that comes up with these plans. I agree. What is I it agree. they're going so, to you know, do? 
Go ahead. Right. So you may have seen like earlier this week, Governor Gavin Newsom of California and then Governors Brown and Inslee of Washington and Oregon. And actually between these three states, one in six Americans lives in these three states. Yeah. They're talking about a significant number of people yeah. and thinking about a strategy that kind of unifies the West Coast. And that completely makes sense to me because although as, as someone who used to work for the federal government in the intelligence service where you really want that, you know, overarching leadership, you still want states to have the autonomy to act locally. Of because compare what's happening in California to what's happening in New York. Really different situation, right? And that calls for a different kind of response right. and a different timeline. Right. And what I think, you know, I keep getting asked this question every day, when do we go back to normal? And I'm trying to caution people that let's maybe think about a new definition of normal because maybe we're not just going back to what we've known but going forward to a different kind of normal. One where maybe in some places eventually quite soon we start seeing some businesses reopen some schools reopen but in a different way to what we've known maybe it means that restaurants are pulling out half their tables and chairs allowing fewer people in using disposable menus so i think your question of when has to factor in also how because how soon we can do these things depends on how nimble we can be how how much people are willing to kind of play by those rules of Fine, I'll reopen, but I won't let a hundred people into my establishment. I'll let fifteen at a time, and things like that. And, and there are, you know, for us as scientists and, and epidemiologists and you know clinicians, it's easy for us to say that. But then, with our economic realities, when we say, "Well, Mr. Restaurant, we need you to just pull out half your table," it's like our our profit margin is five percent of the tables we serve. Yeah, how, away how are we menu. supposed to do that? Right. You know, it's, it's like there's yeah, no restaurant no. now. It, it ends. That's the end of my restaurant. And so that's the stuff I worry about. The Maybe unforce- you could put the, the menu in the dishwasher. <laughs> we'll figure something out. Well, that's the <laughs> point. That's my menu. point. But that is my point, Susan, yeah. is that in, in, this calls for innovation. It really calls for innovation. And, and that's what I'm looking for. And I just am not hearing it out of the leadership, even though I've no, I, have, I think the leadership has done a, in this state, I'm talking about California, done a marvelous job. I'm all about it. I'm signed up. It's been on behalf of goodwill. We've all signed up together, and the leadership has done a great job. I'm not. I'm worried about the next step, like you are. I, I don't quite get how it happens, but I, I hope they come up with I, it. I think. I think you're right, though, about that lack of innovation. And as someone who literally lives in Silicon Valley, I'm kind of like, come on, folks. Where like, are you? That's where right. is that disruption? And we heard some promising things early on, and actually, some things I think like AI that will help us the next time around more quickly detect new cases. But in terms of helping us reopen, I share those frustrations because honestly, some of my favorite businesses have already gone out of business. They haven't even survived a bit. Like, forget about reopening, right? And that's heartbreaking. And and that's just like decimating our communities (laughs) and our high streets. So yeah, I'm frustrated about that too. I want to see more like cross-disciplinary work, more innovation, like help us figure out how we can resume some kind of normal. So let me switch a little bit to a little bit of epidemiology for a second. <clears throat> part, again, I apologize for my morning stuff. I've had it ever since I oh, had pneumonia. I had pneumonia about 14 years ago, and it's been the same ever since. Well, so you've little... always coughed, and you've... I don't know. And I've reflux, so yeah, whatever. Yes. Um, but, Tell everybody but, you have um, They'll feel sorry for you. <laughs> but I, I part of the emotional situation for all of us is a sense of uh, helplessness because we can't see and predict the future very well. Yeah. Uh, I have yeah. found it reassuring, and people that watch this, re- this, this, this stream know that I review with them the covid19.healthdata.org out of Wa- University of Washington, Dr. Murray's data, which to me, it, it, it's been the closest to a good reflection of where we are and where we're going. Of course, no model can actually do that. The virus decides where we're going, right. but but it's been a pretty right. good. It's been a pretty good. And so, my question to you is: A, am I good looking at those models? Are there models that you like better? That's one question. And the other is: This is a, this is a tougher question. Uh, it seems to me a lot of people are hanging on the daily death rate, which is a lagging indicator. My clinical experience mm. has been that our peers are getting pretty good at dealing with this illness. And I'm expecting, I'm seeing the ICU utilization, the ventilator utilization, and the death rate drop in front of my eyes. And I'm not seeing mm-hmm. reflected in the data. Am, are my anecdotes overly optimistic? Or am I right that we should see the slope start to accelerate on the daily death rate going forward as that lagging indicator catches up with what our peers are actually doing? You're gonna so there's two questions. Ask, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let me answer that second one yeah. first about the death rates. I think yeah. that's really interesting. And yeah. also just even at the best of times, 
up to one third of death certificates can list the wrong cause of death in the U.S. Oh, well, uh, let, uh, let me let me let me stop you. The laws, particularly in California, around how physicians fill out the death certificate, or even L.A. County, is ridiculous. We cannot describe the actual cause of death the way they restrict right. and our descriptions right. of what's in the one, two, and three categories of what it it, en- it ends up it ends up being in ninety percent of of um, death certificates cardiopulmonary arrest as the cause of death. Well, n- no kidding. That, Which, that's, <laughs> right. So, I was just going to say, mm, what killed you? Eventually yeah, your heart stopped beating. Yeah, and, your heart, right, yeah and you stop breathing, your heart stopped beating. Oh, okay. The coroner goes, oh, accept that. Okay, perfect. Right. So, I know it's so frustrating. And I think that's just in general, a thing that you have to, like a big caveat that hangs over death data. I think you're right though, in the historically, and even with respiratory epidemics, once you see a plateau and then a decline, that decline can be quite rapid. You're right that the numbers we see do have that lag, plus there's that reporting inaccuracy issue that I raised. Yep. Um, but I, again, still worry that we can just get very complacent, because that's what humans are like. You start to see that decline, and then you don't guard against future outbreaks. And for me, any which way that you're passing the data, we have a model, and we'll talk about that in a second, whether it's death data, whatever, in the back of our mind has to be, or the front of our mind has to be, there's going to be a second wave. There are going to be future outbreaks. How do we make sure that we're constantly protecting ourselves against those and not getting complacent? That, oh, right. oh, look, the numbers are going down. It looks great. And we've seen in Singapore and Italy, like how those spikes can recur yeah. when you start to get complacent. But but it, it seems to me that that I don't. Ex- we're not going to get complacent. I, I, we're going to get what we're going to get is. Um, I don't know. No, no, no. I don't listen, know. we do get I, complacent. I, I think you may agree with me. I, listen to what I'm going to say. We don't get complacent. We get uh, restless, and um, uh, uh, we become like teenagers. We we become you know uh, civilly disobedient. We start acting out, and and that's not complacency. <laughs> that's just that's just immaturity. <laughs> that's what we do, uh, and, and so that's what. And I worry that if we if people don't start acting like adults and we don't treat them like adults, they're going to start acting out more. So there's that my concern, and and so back to your your issue about complacency. At the core, at the core of how we do this without getting complacence is a effective therapeutics that we really understand, which is still a cloud over that. There's still a fog over that right now. And B, exactly what we were talking about before, which is testing and tracking, which again, they're not telling us how we can do. So yeah, we can get complacent, but it's incumbent mm-hmm. on everyone else to give us those two pieces of information. So we can, oh, for sure. I mean, we have to have Yeah, that. and contextualize it. Yeah. And also because you raised this really good point that, and I get frustrated with this, I'm a public health physician, and we forget that the first word in that is the public. Yeah. So you can have the best science, but if you're not communicating that in a way that makes sense to people, yeah. then go ahead, give shelter in place orders, and folks won't follow it. And, like you have to be so careful in terms of building that community response, having everyone on board in a way that protects the public. But in the meantime, we have mob actions flying around the internet of all kinds of mobby behaviors that are all the most primitive manifestations of, of how humans behave. If, and if we were, and if we were 150 years ago or 200 years ago, there would be guillotines. Uh, and, 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 yeah. and, and the gui- and the people putting people on guillotines end up on the guillotines. That's how mobs work. I, yeah, I know. I'm so concerned about this. And I just worry that in a rush to lift containment measures, we, don't think about the most vulnerable in our society, the people who are most at risk of All infection, right. most at risk All right. of so, death. So to, and to, that, to that effect, let, let me, let me mm-hmm. I, I'm going to say something provocative in order for you to help me. So, so well, because this is, the, this, is the, this is the part that people are getting <laughs> crazy about. It's like, if I step forward and I go, one death is too many. Well, mm-hmm. now, that's, that's now a, a statement that cannot reflect reality because now we have to stop driving cars. We have to, you certainly have to stop extreme sports. Now, the point is one death is too many. Of course, one death is too many, of course. But if we rally around that as our goal, one death is too many, well, that's it. We can't drive cars and we're never leaving our home. So how do we- But you know, we just, so, we're just, we're just not even doing a great job at the basics. You look at that investigation that showed thousands of people infected in nursing homes, yeah. like those are places where you can have infection control measures yes. that actually work, that yes. protect people. You have isolation rooms. 
we're failing at that most basic level of not looking after our elderly and our vulnerable. I think that's what's heartbreaking. So yeah, you can say like, oh, it's too academic to say one death too many is like the, you know, the end point. But really, I just worry that we're missing the point here. And we're missing this idea that we're losing people that are parts of our family because we haven't been on the ball with this. No, and this I, predates I, the pandemic, Dr. Drew. Course, we we should have been prepared for this. Well, not only that, I mean, look, I worked in nursing homes for years. These are these are extremely challenging environments from an infectious control yeah. standpoint. Very challenging. You have families yeah. coming in and out, but you have we kids know. coming in and out, you have, for sure. you have nurses and, you coming know, SARS, in and out. Yeah. Animals for sure, and no, I appreciate that. Yeah. Animals too. But you know, with SARS 18 years ago, we saw how healthcare settings and nursing homes especially can become real hotbeds for infection. Yeah. And so we should have had our eye on this. And I think it's so heartbreaking. And even now we can say it, but looking back, we're going to be saying it more. Yeah. That there were so many deaths that were preventable. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that part is tragic. No, but, but I, you know, again, I don't work in nursing homes presently, but I did for many, many years. And it wasn't for lack of attention. They, it, it was, mm -hmm. it was ineffective. It's hard. What, it, what they were doing was ineffective. That's what we have to look at. It's like these people are well-meaning. They're working hard. They mm -hmm. protect their patients. Whatever we're doing isn't working. And again, we need, we need, right. We need novel innovation again. We need a different way of doing things. And, and we're just to try to do but the same stuff over and so over. It's going to end up with the same outcome. True. Truly, like, please, can we have some innovation? But some of it just comes down to good old-fashioned leadership. You look what happened with the cruise ships, and I think it was a BuzzFeed investigation, really good investigation, came out a few days ago that showed us that the CEOs of some of those cruise companies knew the virus was spreading and just tried to carry on business as usual. Jeez. And then look how many people got sick that way. That That's criminal to me. That's crazy. And that's tragic that people's lives were endangered because of business decisions. Like well, I, I have to tell yet. you, um, I got H1N1 on a cruise and oh, no. and my son got uh, E. coli, in, 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 enterotoxigenic, invasive oh, E. coli on a cruise. Oh, wow. Uh, same same cruise line. Yes, yeah, same <gasps> cruise line, different You're times. Kidding. And received no, no follow-up from anybody no, in public we, health we on either of those. That yeah. Awful. Yeah. Oh my God, was your son okay? Spent a week in Spain. Yes, I does. Son. I sat up all night. I was in Spain. I sat up all night nursing him, freaking the hell and out. I got as to he, stay behind. Yeah. Poor oh, kid. Yeah, oh That's scary infection. Oh the water. my God. It was it was unbelievable. And then the I, my H one N one almost killed me. So that was back in two thousand nine oh during that God. outbreak. Yeah, Blue is Blue is no joke. <laughs> Yeah, it's no oh, joke. No. So, it's yeah, no you were joke. basically a nurse. Yeah, no, flu is terrifying. And the thing is, we should have known about that too, because as you have just highlighted, epidemics on cruise ships are pretty common, especially things like norovirus, the mm. winter vomiting virus, just because of the, the way people are packed together. So yeah. for those CEOs who made a decision like that, yeah. knowing what they know about how disease spreads, like there needs to be ramifications for that. And that cannot happen in the future. So so let me go back to my two questions about uh, modeling and you know epidemiology. So I'm using this University of Washington thing to help me see where I am. Is there a better model out there that you rely on? I like that one, actually. And I actually find it useful to compare some different models, um, including some ones that are coming out of the UK. Okay. But big caveats there. So I used to do modeling for HIV specifically in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think just from being in the nitty gritty of it, you realize you put so many assumptions into models and they're as useful yeah. as the interpretation of them. And, and my concern with models yeah. is the way that they get interpreted and the way they generate headlines where you're like, no, right. that's not what the take home point. And right. I don't know if you remember during Ebola, there was this big model came out of the CDC. It said 1.4 million people would get Ebola. And there were so many headlines. Months after that model came out of CDC, I went to right. interview those scientists and I said, why did you say that? Why did your model predict that? And they said, oh, because nobody was doing anything. So we wanted to generate some concern about the situation. That's a great, that's as know, a to me, print, to me, that is as egregious as the uh, CEOs of the, of the cruise liners, because that is consciously I, oh, in, inducing panic in the name of their sense of what ought to be happening. That is egregious. But I think it's, but I think it's also the role of journalists, Dr. Drew, to say, hey, this model says 1.4 million infections if nothing is done, if there's no testing, right. no tracing, Correct. no isolation, right? And, and Those so, are massive caveats. 
And those are some of the models, the numbers that we've seen that are wild also say that. It's like if nothing is done, if no one gets the test, right. not a single person yes. wears a mask, well, then of course you're going to see massive so, numbers. I don't think it makes those models useless. I think we should just talk uh, about well, them. Well, we hold on. But I, I agree with the way you framed it. I, 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 you know, there's nothing wrong with what you said, but let me tell you about my history. <laughs> so when that University of London, what was that uh, that organization that put out those? Imperial. Uh, Imperial, College, Imperial College. Imperial College. Imperial put out their data. Uh, that was on the front page of the New York Times for two weeks as this is going to happen. So I got in trouble by pushing back very hard on that. And now everyone took everything I said out of out of context. Uh, and but Dr. Duke, can I interrupt you really yes, quickly please. just to say that as that was happening, what was the situation in the UK? Right, We have to ask ourselves that question. The situation in the UK at that time was a government saying, oh, we'll just let many people get infected and then there'll probably be this thing called herd immunity. And so I think that model led to a rapid about turn. I think the day after or three days after that model came out, the British government was like, right, we're going to do shelter in place now. Things are changing. You're only allowed outside the house once a day to exercise now. And I was like, whoa, look at the impact of that model. They have gone from quite a casual response to this to a real like, no, we're taking it seriously. Maybe. Maybe that was the reason they did. And I can't argue with that. What I'm arguing with is the journalist putting it on the New York Times front page saying, Oh, I'm not going to disagree with yeah, you there. This is I'm the not future. Disagree this with you is there. your That's future, including the post. Including the post, I saved this headline saying 750,000 New Yorkers will be hospitalized. This is, this to me is, will. and, and as, yeah. as I've said, panic is never helpful. And for the no, journalists to induce, panic can be dangerous. Yes, and so for them to induce, that's the that's what I was railing about from the beginning, and so upset about. And I don't, you know, and now we're in the fog of war, and uh, the panic is here. Mm -hmm. And I hope we're making good decisions. I think we are in California. I think we are, but uh, only in retrospect will we really know. To be fair, yeah, um, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you did not mention the other models you like looking at. Oh, um, different ones at different times and also for different situations. So Imperial College, I did find that one useful and they've had some other models come out there. UCLA is doing some interesting modeling, but I use them in a way I think that just helps me. I don't want to generate a headline that says this will happen, right, but course. you're forecasting potential situations. So even that Imperial model had a few different scenarios in it, right? Yeah. They didn't all get reported, unfortunately. No, just the wild that, yes. of the biggest numbers got of reported. But, you know, and, they, and by the way, yeah. to report it once, I'm all in favor of that, going, ooh, look at this horrible this data that we're, we're facing. But to put it out there every day as this is your future, it's like, oh, God, that's... And that, the thing me, that I worry... Go ahead. The thing that I worry about then is people are like, well, look, nothing happened. You guys scared right. us there were going to be 10 million That's, or whatever. But look, look, so what, did we just do shelter in place for no reason? You're like, no, I that, promise so, you that we did so it for a good reason. You, but, you, ju you just yeah. predicted, you just described our future. So that's going to be the yeah. next phase of this, which is you scared the hell out of me. Why did I listen to you? Yeah. And, and so, so and, let me, and, and that yeah, too, let me say something about that. Go ahead. Yeah, and some of, and some of that won't be in response to the models, Dr. Drew. It will be in response to us sheltering in place aggressively, yeah. at least in some places like California and doing it really early. Yeah. People will point fingers at us and say, look, it's nowhere near as bad as you said it right. would be. There right. were deaths, but you know, not as many as you said. And we'll say, yes, because as early as we could or, you know, as early as we did, we instituted containment measures. If we hadn't, it would have been way worse. Uh, but I, you it, don't it, want it to get way worse. I, I'd, I'd rather have those fingers pointing at me saying it wasn't as bad as you said. And I'll be like, good. I'm so glad it wasn't. And, and I heard every word you said, and I agree with it. But I'm fearful that what the the upset and sort of uh, the the our audience that is now trying to re, re recapture their life that has been turned upside down is going to hear us going blah 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 blah. And, oh, it's already and, happening. Yeah, so I'm scared about that. Oh, That's my already gosh. happening. Unfortunately, I know we could have done such a better job at communicating this, at saying it could get really bad, but hey, look, we can bring it down if we do these things and prevent the worst case scenarios. And unfortunately, we haven't been as diligent about that communication as we could have been. Well, I thought I thought Newsom did a pretty good job of saying, hey, uh, maybe you don't care about yourself, but we're worried about your neighbor. Stay in place so you don't infect somebody else. This is a collective here. It's a, we're, we're Americans. We're going to do this for one another. Let's get together and do this. 
I thought that was perfect. And 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 that's why yeah, that's why it was like, it happened boom like that. Everyone took it on board. Now he's getting a yeah, little Yeah, like big, I like I said. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, like I said, the first word in public health is public, right? Yeah. You're not just thinking about your health, you're thinking about your neighbor, the homeless man who lives down the road, the kid around the corner who has cancer and is on chemo. Yeah, yeah. It's not just about you, it's about the collective good. But what the, the what we're getting into now is a little bit of paternalism and the public does not like that. And that's kind of why I think I think you're seeing this kind of acting out behavior. I suspect. I suspect. Yeah, and that's gonna be I think it's already playing out to be potentially dangerous and we have to communicate this stuff in a way like yeah i may know the science and you may know this part of the science but we want everyone to be buying into this and we want communities to feel empowered that the decisions being made are the right ones for them and i'm not saying that's easy i'm not saying it's easy at all but it really requires a team effort yeah. and we haven't seen good leadership to instigate that unfortunately in yeah. many places i think california has been ahead of the curve we were the first to have up here at least Santa Clara and five other counties were the first to have shelter in place orders and then the rest of the state closely after. But there are still states that don't have the right kind of protective measures. What, uh, I, I don't want to necessarily put you in a, a prescriptive position or even a, a prognosticating position, but, but I'm wondering what keeps you up at night right now. Mm, the vulnerable, mm. just concern about those people that already have underlying conditions, and also, I worry that if we rush to get back to quote unquote normal, we won't be keeping an eye out enough for future outbreaks of this disease. And that we'll go back to a normal where a ton of people, millions are uninsured, where people work when they're sick because they don't have good sick pay leave. So I worry about going to business as usual, which was a set of systems and circumstances that led us to this mess. Like, please, can we fix the things that led us to this to make sure it doesn't happen like this again in the future? Can we make sure people have paid sick leave for the minute they have a cough, they stay at home, look after themselves, but protect the rest of us too? Can we make sure the minute someone doesn't feel well, they have access to a good doctor, they have access to the right test? That's the stuff that keeps me up at night. And then finally, let me let me switch your topic. Let's switch topics entirely. Let's talk about medical myths and why they persist, and you know, the sort of the, the the spread of misinformation, which is your expertise. Uh, are, are we at a time when that's at an unusually high pitch right now? Is there an underlying basis for that uh, that you know of? Whether it's out in the way press is distributing information, or is there something in our personality structures or social circumstances that are leading to so much of this? What's your what, I know it's a gigantic question, but I'll let you riff on it for a minute. It's such a fascinating topic, though, and I could talk about this for hours because it's bad now because, you know, there's a global health crisis, so that kind of explains it. But it's been here for so long. Do you think about before this, we were seeing outbreaks of vaccine-preventable diseases in the U.S., mm -hmm. like American kids dying of whooping cough when we have a vaccine for it. Mm -hmm. And these anti-science and anti-vaccine myths and misinformation has been doing work steadily, bringing down rates of vaccinations in some areas. So I don't want us to think, oh, this is a brand new problem when it's been around for a long time. I do want public health organizations like the WHO, like CDC, to pay much more attention to the health misinformation and not focus just on viruses and just on pathogens, but think about these myths because they fuel the spread of epidemics. So that's definitely happening. And with social media, with the internet, the speed and the scale of these things is that kind of new. Um, but we just need to pay a lot more attention to it because that endangers people. You must have heard about that couple in Arizona where the man died and his wife ended up in the ICU because they heard the president say that chloroquine could treat this. And they took the chloroquine in their house and poisoned themselves. Yeah, like crazy. that's how directly misinformation can impact people's lives. And I really worry about that. What, one of the anecdotes of, I, I imagine you've seen lots and lots of different stories of these viral misinformation um, waves. Any anecdotes that can help us, um, a story that can help us uh, look at ourselves in the mirror in the present? I think just think about some of the things that you might have clicked share on, on Facebook, on Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, whatever, maybe even something that you repeated to somebody else without checking it first. 
And the thing is, Dr. Drew, some of these myths and hoaxes spread like wildfire because they're very memorable and they're very sticky. Like they stay in your head because they're kind of sensational. Well, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, them... let me say that uh, my restream is lit up with people saying they looked into that and that's not what happened. It was some accidental, you know, we, the press reported it as a, somebody bringing in chloroquine. It turned out to be a totally different story. So... Even no, that, even I, that well, story, woman, even that story turns out to be right, not right. So, right, right. There's, there's, well, as I, usually, I there's more to the, it. There's more to it, as always. Sure, but I think, but it's not a bad thing to kind of investigate and look into something that feels very sensational, very memorable, kind of maybe scary, emotional, before you hit share on it. And yeah. I think you can just oftentimes the things that are very sensational are the ones that don't have are the ones that have inaccuracies in them right. because the scientists often sound boring because they're saying, well, we learned this, but there could be these limitations to the study. It often isn't as catchy as the thing that says, drink bleach, you'll be cured, right? That spreads a lot more than here are three caveats of mathematical models of COVID-19. So just be wary about what you're forwarding, what you're retweeting, what you're sharing word of mouth. Do your due diligence of checking the sources and not being someone who's contributing to the spread. Right. I, I think I think there's even a step before that is that people have to care. They have to care. They, they don't seem mm. to care about what they're spreading. They seem to be validated. They get the dopamine hit from just going ah, and spreading it. They, they get all high on that as opposed to using your frontal cortex and caring about what you're spreading out and what the consequence may be. And I wonder if some of that is just not the realization that information can be very powerful. So you might put on a mask because you don't want to spread disease and you're aware, you're, you care about that. But then you open your mouth to share misinformation and myths and hoaxes without re realizing that can do as much damage. And so we do need to care. We need to be diligent and really me remembering the power of words and the power of information. I hope people do. I really do. Um, well, uh Dr. Yasmin, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate you spending some time with us. It's helped me focus my attention a little bit. Uh, and let me remind everyone that uh, Dr. Seema Yasmin, disease detective, public health physician, epidemic intelligence service officer. Uh, book is debunked, Pseudoscience, Medical Myths, and Why They Persist. I think I'm certain that you get into a lot of the stuff in that book that uh, we're talking about here. And uh, today is just, uh, we're living in that world of um, misinformation. Totally. And that book isn't out until next year, but ah. you can follow my reporting on YouTube with Wired. Um, I do have another book out that's about the HIV epidemic and a new book that's out in two weeks called Muslim Women Are Everything. But I'm definitely on top of this, keeping an eye for what misinformation is spreading and trying to debunk it every few days, in fact. So T if you follow me again, on Twitter, the, Instagram, check out. And the, yeah. the, the new book again is what? It's called Muslim Women Are Everything, Stereotype Shattering Stories of Courage, Inspiration, and Adventure. Great. It's about women breaking barriers and living their best lives. And it's kind of an inspirational read, which I think we might need at this time. Yes. And then your handles on, on uh, internet are? My Twitter handle is at Dr. Yasmin with Dr. Spelled Out. And on Instagram, it's Dr. Seema Yasmin. And I like getting questions there because I use those questions to think about what video do I need to make next and what questions are people really worried about. And then please do look into that uh, fish chloroquine story because uh, the, my, my, I will, uh, my, I will. my restream is lighting up with people with all kinds of stories about it being a, a poisoning and an attempted murder and blah, 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 all kinds of other stuff. So I what, sure what really went on there. And, I, and again, but it's, if, if indeed it's something different than what we you and I were discussing, <clears throat> it's a good example of how, how we distill things down to a cartoon level uh, in in sure. the social media, and and if it gratifies us in some way, we spread it. That is not the way to spread information. The way to no, spread information no. is to we look at it objectively. So yeah, all right. Yeah, but thank you so much for having this conversation. It's been great talking to you. You as well. I appreciate it so much, and hopefully we can talk again. Thank and everyone you. Everyone, follow Dr. Yasmin. Sure. We'll see you soon. Thank you. I'm going to stay back for a stay second. Stay well. Bye. Bye bye now. Uh, address the restream, everybody. Uh, thank you all, and uh, don't be. Dissing? <laughs> I'm, nobody's dissing, uh, Jesse. I hope not. Uh, so if you guys have any questions about where we are today, uh, I will tell you we are going to be back on the stream in about four hours. Uh, Susan, tell us about that guest, Annie Ramoyne. Dr. Anne Ramoyne. Anne Ramoyne. She's an epidemiologist. How do you say it? Epidemiologist. Ep epidemiologist. So we're going to get deeper into the weeds on the stuff that you guys like reviewing on this little stream uh, and see if she can help us. 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. 
the Pacific, yeah. So people wonder how New York is. And New York, New Jersey are, of course, in it. They are suffering uh, more than any other region. They are on the downslope in terms of the daily deaths, though. However, they've uh, passed their peak two days past. The uh, University of Washington is, is asking that they begin their containment strategy on June 1st. So it means New York's going to be locked down for a while. They are also on the downslope of their resource utilization, and they're meeting all their demands by this uh by this model, and they are intact to about 21,000 deaths. So, you know, literally, uh, as you compare the deaths in New York at 21,000 versus California, Susan, can you look up to how many people live in New York? California is 1,600. 1, a lot of people. I, I think, I, I think. Make a guess. I'm going to say 25 million. Um, and in New that York. That includes all of, not just, you want Manhattan or you want the, I want New York, New York State. Because because California, which has around the order of forty million, has sixteen hundred deaths. So uh, that nineteen point four five right. million. So so we have twice the population and nearly half the deaths. So It'll be interesting to see how many people move out of there <clears throat> next year. Move out of New York, yeah, yeah. yeah that's gonna be. I a think little. Paulina's moving. Is that right? She wants to go to New Orleans. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, that's <laughs> out of the frying pan into the fire a bit. But, uh, eight million New York kid. City. That's right. Uh, no, I was asking about the state of California. All right, so let's wrap this one up. Uh, and as I said, we'll be back in about four hours. Uh, you to want to answer any questions for I, people? I'm they're, not they're seeing very any. Patient today. Uh, yes, they were, and I'm not seeing any. Well, I, think they were, I think they were all uh, watching and listening to Dr. Yasmin. People were actually pretty nice today. We didn't have too many people going off on us, but I'm sure they'll come. Okay. Sorry about the sound at the beginning. I don't know why that happened. She was fine when she called in. But. What do I think about the Moderna vaccine entering phase two human trials? I think it's fantastic. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Va- I, I would like to be in those trials just so I can get some immunity against this thing. Who cut your hair? Susan Pinsky, the <laughs> cosmetologist, who's re- because of all your grief, she's refusing to cut it any further because <laughs> she wants you to see that I look like Doc Brown uh, after about three weeks. Uh, so good luck with that. Uh, we'll see. Oh, we have to have Alex Michelson on. Okay. He Somebody said, you know, because they're mad that he's not going to be, you're not going to be doing the Facebook feed right, at the end. Right, right. He's not going to be there Monday. Poor guy needs a day off. Yeah, it's going to be a different. I, I would love to have him on tomorrow, but I think he needs a couple days off to relax because he works 13-hour shifts seven days a week. And, I mean, if, he'll, if he wants to come on, I, maybe he'll be bored at home. I don't know. <laughs> So somebody's asking about Iowa and that they're not getting a stay-at-home order. That is because you have such low levels of out of uh, of disease progression and such a uh, high level of resources that you're not going to in any way uh, exhaust your resources. And what you've done by not doing the stay-at-home is you've protracted the whole thing. So it, the whole your curves in terms of hospitalizations go out to the middle of June. So I'm guessing that when they start making recommendations from this model, here it is, for containment, they're saying begin your, begin your containment in July. So you, you're sort of not out of the woods until July, but then you haven't done a stay-at-home order along the way, so there may not be as dire consequence for you all. Uh, Georgia's in a very kind of similar situation, very similar, though they're hospital. Yeah, it's very similar, um, though the death rate's a little higher in Georgia. And then uh, where else are people asked? People always ask about Illinois. Illinois is a little quicker. They're peaking sooner. Actually already have peaked. They're about one day since the peak resource use. And again, high 2,200 fatalities in this one. Yeah, and uh, you're on the backside of the uh, death rate. But we, we didn't get in. We'll get more into it with the epidemiologists this afternoon, exactly how we should be thinking about these daily death rates and this business of h- how do we numbers wise how do we get back to work and 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 if we say one death is too many well then we'll we never open up we can never open up then because there's always a potential for somebody to die of this thing so what is a realistic numbers how, how do we do that how do we understand where we're going how do we understand when we're okay and when we're not okay those are the kinds of questions i want to get into okay new jersey you guys are like new york uh getting hit really rough uh, New Jersey is uh, two days since their peak daily deaths. 
your daily death rates are pretty high for a state your size. What, 200, what are the 266. Oh. Um, you are having trouble meeting your resource needs, but you are uh, three days since the peak of that and you're doing good. 6,900 COVID deaths in New Jersey. That's an extraordinary number. That's an extraordinary number. Uh, and uh, I hope that number comes down when we get some of the, that. That remind me, I'm going to look up New Jersey uh, when we come back this afternoon and talk about whether or not the treatment strategies that we're using will reduce that fatality. There rate. are 8.882 million in Jersey. Mm -hmm. 8.2 that... million. So literally, again, a fourth the size of of California, with <clears throat> excuse me, with five, four times the death rate. Yeah. So that's. Oof. That's a hospital problem, huh? Mm, yeah, it's and an, I don't under, I know, like, I'm, well, I'm going to ask close you. together and they have to take public transportation. Right, and maybe there may be a health care issue yeah, more embedded in there too. Issues, yeah. So we'll, we'll ask the epidemiologist if she can uh, help us understand it, unpack it. I just wonder how many, what the ratio of, of elderly is in each state. Like nobody's really I, looked I, at I that. know, I, I understand. And that's uh, those are tard. Somebody said cancer, Massachusetts has improved. Let me take a look at that. Two days since your peak fatality. Ooh. Your fatality rate fell off dramatically. That's interesting. Uh, you're at peak utilization and making it through just fine. Again, 3,200 deaths in a state the size of Massachusetts is rough. But what would be interesting with your drop in your case fatality rate, if that's a real drop, you dropped to zero yesterday. If that is in any way sustained, let's say you stay at 20 to 50, uh, the overall death rate will drop. And that, that's another good, we'll look at Massachusetts this afternoon with the epidemiologist too. That'll be an interesting sort of thing to talk about and speculate that we, again, we'll be speculating only. We won't be able to know. Uh, let me just look at you guys. Treat elderly with vitamin A, C, D, and zinc. I agree with that. Uh, I'm taking it myself. Susan, are you taking A, a C, no. D, and zinc? You should be, even though you're a specimen and don't have to I, worry about anything. I don't have any. I... Let's go get that for you. Yeah. Uh, you should be on, you should be on C, D, and zinc. In my humble. I'll opinion. look in my care package. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> I have some vitamins somewhere. All right, let's do that. Uh, care of vitamins. Yeah. All right, let's wrap this up. Thank you guys. Good questions. Uh, great guest. Uh, thank you, Michelle Poe, for for scheduling that guest for us. Yeah, and, Michelle. Uh, thank you. She's doing. She's working on a um, production and is meeting all these amazing people and sending them our way. Yeah. And we will talk to again an epidemiologist. That yeah, we'll Maybe a little shorter conversation um, because it's really weeds, bio, you know, uh, Dr. mathematics. Anne yeah. Ramoy. And I don't want to do too she's much She's from of UCLA. That. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And apparently she's amazing, according to Michelle. Great. We will do that and we'll see you this afternoon. See you then. <laughs> whispering uh-oh i'm not you sure you just it's good sprung form. it on me i have to have I, my outro ready sorry bye everyone We've all been very focused on how to stay healthy these days, but uh, we've not been talking about hydration. If you get coronavirus, flu, or even experience allergies, cold, a variety of everyday ailments, they all need hydration. And that's why it's a perfect time to welcome our friends at Hydrolyte back. This is a great product. You all know I've talked about it for a long time. This was the hydration product I wanted to invent, and they got it there before me. Now, remember, dehydration can make you feel sick, even a slight amount, and none of us need that anxiety right now. So stay well hydrated. I am thrilled to welcome our good friends at Hydrolyte back to the show. Longtime fans remember my obsession with Hydrolyte, which is literally the best hydration product I have found. I'm even more excited to introduce their brand new single serve powder sticks. Simply pour one powder stick into a glass of water. They recommend seven ounces. The powder dissolves instantly and creates the perfect balance of sodium, glucose, and water to deliver up to four times the electrolytes of your typical sports drink. And think about it. You can take this anywhere. You should have it on hand to just pour it into water, and you have a real significant hydration product. The other great news about Hydrolyte, the powder sticks, they are 100% natural, no artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners, and they are available in flavors like orange and lemon.